Welcome to Choosing the Right Front End Style Guide workflow for your project, otherwise known as the longest session title ever. Uh, we're going to be talking about style guides today, specifically pattern libraries, front end style guides. There's lots of names for them. I'm Aaron. Uh, I work for a company called Four Kitchens in Austin, Texas, and uh, rapidly growing all over the world now uh, with our team. Uh, I'm a creative director and partner there. That means I work with our uh, designers and creative team and UX team to um, you know come up with the right uh, workflows on projects, uh, do QA work, discuss you know kind of set the design process for our company uh, as well as doing sales things like that for our company. So this is not an overly technical uh, presentation. Uh, it's kind of to give you an overall kind of intro to different style guides and approaches, and there are tons and tons of resources for uh, further reading later. Uh, so let's jump into it. So you may or may not be familiar with traditional style guides. Uh, a lot of times they're distributed as a PDF. Uh, some marketing agency will come up with them. Uh, back in December, this thing appeared on the internet. It wasn't officially released by NASA, but it was the NASA Style Guide. And this is really exciting, right? Because NASA is awesome, and we all like spaceships, and that's really cool. So we were really excited to see this thing get kind of leaked out into the public. You know, every kind of tech blog kind of picked it up and was showing this to people. Uh, as you can imagine, it had kind of the typical stuff, you know, how to use their logo, how not to use their logo, what colors NASA likes to use, uh, kind of the different type typography treatment they use in their different materials, um, how to talk about NASA in brochures and print materials, how to create NASA business cards and other stationery. Uh, they wouldn't even went so far as to sh show you how to put the NASA emblem on, uh, you know, the tails of planes and other NASA you know, vehicles in their fleet. Really cool stuff. And there's one page dedicated to electronic media. Right? That's pretty exciting. Um, finally, we get to see, you know, okay, we see how they do all their print materials. That's great. But let's see, you know, how they build their websites and, you know, how they approach online branding. And awesome. They even provided two links to go to these resources. Right? So awesome, links. Ah, uh, both of those links sent, to, sent you to a page like this, right? So, you know, if those two links were out of date and just sent you to dead pages, you know, like who knows what else in that guide was out of date and, you know, was no longer current and, you know, what version were they on and what's relevant? Like there was no way of knowing. So uh, stepping back in time a little bit, back to 2012, uh, Starbucks made the announcement announcement that they went responsive. And this is a really big deal because, you know, Starbucks is a really big brand, global brand. Um, and, you know, back in 2012, uh, responsive was still kind of in the, its early days. So, you know, for a major brand like this to go full responsive with their online uh, property, that's really amazing. And then this other thing kind of leaked out uh, that they, you know, uh, in the you know, web design community, it was a style guide for their new responsive site. Wow. This is amazing. This is like Willy Wonka, like t grabbing you by the hand and taking you through a tour of the factory. You know, they really kind of opened up, uh, you know, how they were building this whole thing. And it was really complete. Uh, it had typography, buttons, their whole grid system, how they build page layouts, um, you know, navigation, media forms. Like, you could build any kind of, you know, Starbucks or franchise page or any kind of online property uh, just using the style guide that they put out there. And uh, though they didn't have the, the open, the source code available to you, you know, it was easy enough to dig through it. Um, so that's really awesome. So, you know, if you kind of look back to this NASA style guide that they put out there, you know, it was dead on arrival. You know, we had no way of knowing, you know, that's a dead style guide. What you really want is a living style guide, something that's online, anybody can access anytime, and it's easy to up, you know, update and keep, uh, you know, current. So you might be asking, you know, why, why create this? So let's just go into a couple of specifics. You know, that, those old, PDF, old style guides, they're PDFs. No t way to tell what the latest version is, hard to distribute, hard to keep up to date, impossible to document. You know, you're using a PDF to document, you know, web guidelines, and that's kind of dumb. You know, and it's impossible to do web interactivity. So, you know, let's just throw all that out. Uh, you know, what you want for a living style guide is, you know, it's going to immediately provide provide team-wide, uh, you know, communication. Um, everyone in the organization will be able to, you know, contribute to it, 
Um, they'll be able to read it. Teams will be able to work together better. You're going to have design consistency. This is a screenshot taken from a bank website. And these are all the different buttons on the website. And you can see how it's a, just a giant mess and it looks horrible. So you know, one thing that you have a style guide is you have designers and developers working from the same kind of documentation. You, know, you can aim for reusability. You can not just you know, create a new button every time you need one. Uh, additionally, you know, speaking back to reusability, you know, if, you've got, if you're creating these patterns and components for all the different pieces of your website, uh, plus the aim of reusability, that's going to lead to faster build times for your team, right? So that's a good advantage. So besides the things I, uh, I already mentioned, you know, there's some more technical advantages, avoid, avoiding CSS bloat. Um, you know, it's made with actual HTML and CSS, unlike those PDFs. You know, you're actually building in the medium um, that you know, you're providing your documentation for. You know, they're one and the same. Um, you make it available online, easy to find, uh, make it easy to edit. And then uh, you know, the biggest advantage is you have version control. So if you throw that thing up in GitHub, whether it's private or public, you know, you're going to have, you know, you, you keep track of the revisions. You're not going to lose anything. And you'll always know what the current version is. So what's in a style guide? Uh, there's all kinds of flavors out there. Um, one of the common ones you'll see out there is branding. So you know, we saw that in the NASA style guide, yeah, they provided logos. But could you download them? No, the website they sent you to didn't exist. So here, you know, if you have the style guide, you're not only documenting how to use the logos, how not to use the logos, but then you have links to the PDFs, or sorry, the PNGs and the you know Illustrator files and vector files uh, that you can actually go forward and use them. You could do uh, what Mailchimp did, and they provided a writing guide, a writing style guide for their team. So they have a very specific kind of like tone and voice for their brand. If you're a customer, you'll kind of see they have a lot of humor in their emails and things like that. So they throw that up online for all their writing team to reference um, so that all of their kind of you know, voice and tone across all their materials is consistent. Uh, additionally, you'll see uh, people like Google put out uh, things like design language. So with the material design that's slowly rolling out to your different Android dev devices. Um, you know, they included some specifics about how to design Android uh, apps. But they created this thing called material design, which is really more of like the philosophy of how, you know, why, what is, what's, what is behind material design? What is the design thinking behind it? And the philosophy of, you know, what were they trying to do here in this big, you know, redesign? So that's kind of a big, broad, kind of ambitious uh, thing. You can get more specific. So if you have a really large team of developers, you want them all kind of, you know, using the same amount of, you know, having all their, you know, um, text editor set up the correct way, and they're you know writing you know PHP and you know SAS syntax and kind of in a standard way, so it doesn't have to you know change it. So you might put up you know you might would do what GitHub did here, and they have JavaScript guidelines for developing for GitHub CSS guidelines, uh, and they put all that up all line, up online available for anyone to see. Um, <clears throat> This is probably the bulk of what we're going to be talking about today. So I mentioned it a little bit earlier today about, you know, this has a million names. Component library, pattern library, UI library, front end style guide. This is kind of breaking down your, piece, your website into its basic components and the building blocks, showing the design on the page, and providing code samples so that everyone is, you know, design, designers, developers, project managers, business owners, they're all kind of on the same page. They're all speaking the same language about these things. Uh, they're not rewriting the SAS or the HTML. Like it's all laid out here, you know, for the different components. So really, it's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure for how you want to build your own style guide. You could do just one of these things. You could do all of them. Uh, it's really kind of up to you about you know where you want to start, which people in your team you want to talk to, um, you know, who you want to get to get involved. I would advise probably starting with the basics. You know, things like your branding assets, your logo, the color the typography, your grid, kind of how pages are laid out, and then um, you know, thinking about those building blocks of your site, you know, whether they're carousels or you know, uh, pagers or breadcrumbs or whatever. Uh, I like this quote by Susan Robertson. She wrote a really great article on Lissa Part about creating style guides. She said, it's a, you know, your style guide is a one-stop place for the entire team, from product owners and producers to designers and developers to reference when discussing site changes and iterations. So again, it's just a common vocabulary for the entire team to use in any kind of discussions, whether you're you know, talking about building a new, you know, whether the business owners are talking about building a new section of the site or the designers and developers are getting into kind of a, you know, in-depth discussion about uh, you know, how to build something. 
So um, this is kind of the meat of the talk, uh, talking about a couple of different approaches. So I have these three different names out here that I'm going to be using to the presentation. Uh, all except the middle one are kind of made up by me. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's not really a standard way to talk about style guides because there's so many different approaches. But from my research, these are kind of the three different categories that I've kind of grouped them into. And these are just kind of the arbitrary labels uh, I gave to them. But uh, hopefully they make sense. Start with the manual style guide. Um, so you know, whatever your process is to do your design exploration and kind of working through your page layouts and you know, through prototyping, things like that, you know, do that however you do it. Then you want to get that into a style guide. You know, you're starting to formalize it. In this manual system, you can kind of uh, do a custom build with something like Jekyll, or there's a couple of different style guide frameworks out there that will kind of help you get started with throwing in you know, basic elements like you know, H1s, H2s, paragraphs, lit, you know, typography stuff, things like that. Uh, then you would you know, kind of using that style guide as a reference, you, know, you jump into the design and build process. Kind of, you know, they're kind of your blueprints for the site. So you're going into your design and build process. And then eventually you make it to production. So uh, we use this on a site uh, that we just recently launched called worldpulse.com. Um, I think it was in development for well over a year. And we, it, it kind of had a long design uh, timeline. So we created this style guide in Jekyll. And it's up there um, at, at the address there. And that'll send you to the GitHub if you want to dig around in the guts of it. Um, but yeah, so this was kind of a way for us to like, you know, build out the style guide, you know, take it step by step, colors, typography, and then you know, as we had more patterns, you know, starting to throw those in there in the guide as they're available, and then our developers could kind of use this as blueprints to then you know build out the site. Um, we've also saw this with um, Code for America. So they recently put up their style, or you know, I think a year ago they put up their style guide so everyone could check it out. Um, I think it was built by a company called Clear Left. Um, interesting with them, they didn't actually do the implementation. They were hired just to do the design work. So they built this really awesome uh, pattern library, and that was the deliverable. So you know, they did all the research and discovery and all that, did the design work, and then as a deliverable for you know, whatever team that was going to go and implement it, they had this really awesome pattern library to reference. So as I mentioned, there's a couple of different tools. So kind of the two different ways, you know, um, of the kind of manual style guys I've seen, um, a lot, if they're going with a kind of static site approach, uh, I've seen them using things like Je Jekyll and Middleman. Um, and again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different tools out there that will kind of help you get started with your you know, pattern library or UI toolkit, uh, and those are linked there. I think the, probably the biggest drawback uh, with this uh, approach, as opposed to some of the other ones, is how to keep it in sync, because you kind of have two disparate systems. Um, so I'd say number one is just keep the style, the you know the SAS and other assets keep that directory totally like the same as your production environment. So you know I've seen people actually just like you know just copy and paste it and overwrite it. Um, at the very least, you know you know if you add something new to the style guide, you know you're breaking it down in kind of a component based uh, you know SAS directory. You know with you know partial SAS partials for every different component. You know. That's a little bit. That's pretty easy to maintain because then you can just you know grab that one and then throw it into the production site. <clears throat> uh, I was just, I'm not a developer, but I was discussing with some of our developers at Four Kitchens, and they threw out terms like Git subtree merging. I don't know what that means, but maybe you do. <laughs> um, similarly, they uh, mentioned things like Bower, which I'm a little bit familiar with. Um, and there's actually a tool called Style Prototype, actually built by um, Sam Richard, uh, famous Drupaler. Um, and he has a section in the README there about how you can use Bow, you know, you can create, make your production site have the style guide as a dependency in Bower so that you don't have to do any of this manual syncing junk. Like, you know, it's all handled through code. So you can check that out. Uh, a little bit later, we'll be talking about an advanced technique where you can actually turn your style guide into a service that your websites and apps can kind of, you know, ref, you know they'll literally use that. So there's no duplication. They're actually just using that uh, as a tool. So when to use this approach? Um, this is not prescriptive, but here's just some kind of uh, ideas that I have. Um, you know, maybe doing design upfront is not part of your process, um, or at least not you know long design upfront process. Um, maybe your organization, you know, due to time constraints or whatever, or team constraints, you need to kind of just dive into building the thing uh, without spending a lot of time, you know, building the design in a separate system. 
Uh, additionally, you know, maybe you don't have development resources that are available at that time, and you just have designers that you want to crank away on the design. Um, and then I, that uh, Code for America example I mentioned, you know, maybe design is deliverable, so um, you, know, you don't need to mess with the production environment because you can just build a tool that you know, lets you build the component library in the best way that you know, makes sense for your team. Second approach is a generated style guide. So again, kind of you know, just using whatever uh, technique that you use to go through your know, visual design and prototype process. Um, then you would go directly into the design and build. Um, so this is kind of the designer and browser type approach. Uh, the difference here is that with your code that you're uh, developing against, um, generators uh, leverage actually putting your documentation into the like SAS itself. So I'll do, uh, show you an example of that a little bit in a, in a little bit. Uh, but that's the big change there. So you know, directly from your design build, you go to production, and then you run a generator, and by magic, boom, it outputs your style guide. So it's taking your actual production CSS code and turning it into the style guide. You don't, you're not really maintaining two systems. Something else is magically generating that style guide. Um, so you might be asking, what is a generator? So let's do an example with one of the most popular uh, tools out there um, called KSS. There was recently a port by John Albin who created a tool, uh, port it to Node, and you know it's called KSS Node. Uh, but basically, here are the steps. Uh, you would write your SAS like you normally do, add your documentation as comments in the SAS. Uh, on the command line, you're going to run your generator app, whichever one you're using, and then boom, it outputs a style guide. So let's check it out. So this is what the SAS kind of looks like. Um, you know, the big difference here is this big block of stuff that you normally don't have up there. You might have, you know, buttons and that's it, right? But none of this other junk. So the big difference here is, um, so in KSS, by example, um, you would put your title at the top, then your description. So, you know, buttons or if it's a carousel, you would talk about what kind of carousel it is or whatever kind of component you're using. Um, the, the last one is kind of important because this is where it gives your style guide structure. So just like a book, your style guide is going to have chapters and subchapters. So here's where you kind of define that stuff. So here I'm saying it's style guide uh, chapter one, 1.0. 1 this next section is um, getting into uh, kind of the subchapter. So now we're going to start talking about um, these specific set of buttons. So we have our section title, section, section title, default buttons. Um, you know, we might have another section for some other kind of buttons later. Uh, markup, so this is actually the, the markup that it's gonna use to spit out the markup in your style guide. So you can see it says button class, and then it's got this uh, node uh, you know, token here for modifiers, and then it closes the button uh, element. Uh, below that, you're gonna set your classes and states. So for example, I have a button alternate uh, class, I have a button bold class, and you know, I wanna see what happens when I hover it. Um, and then lastly, the important thing about, you know, I'm making this style guide 1.2. So, you know, if I have another section, it would be style guide 1. Point, sorry, this is 1.1. 1 .1. If I had another one, it would be 1.2. Uh, and then just below that, you know, it's just all your, your regular stuff. You just style it like you normally would. So once you have your SAS, you just, uh, you know, of course, you have to install this tool. Um, but once you have it installed, you just run KSS node. What that's going to do is it's going to parse your style sheets. It's going to look for all that syntax that you've written there uh, above your SAS. Uh, then it's going to output static HTML files in your style in a style guide directory. And of course, you know you can change that. And there's all kinds of modifiers to this, you know, command line or this command that you can really modify a lot of different things about your style guide. But this is the basic example. So what that's going to do is output something like this. So by just installing KSS Node, adding that syntax that you saw, running it. I have a page like this, and it's going to, you know, you can see that, um, you know, I didn't write markup for each one of these. I just used that token to say, you know, use this class, this class, and the hover, and, you know, this is all interactive, so I can kind of see how it changes on the page. You can see how it's already started to build my table of contents on the left-hand side. Uh, so this is really cool. Um, I have, all I've done is add my documentation, documentation to my production site, and now I've got a style guide. So um, you're probably wondering, how does this work with Drupal? Uh, I won't <laughs> explain it because John Albin has already done a fantastic job of explaining it at DrupalCon Amsterdam. Uh, I got the link there. Uh, I'll be sharing my slides afterwards so you can get all the, the good links. But a uh, really great presentation how he shows you how to use KSS nodes specifically against a Drupal environment. 
Uh, so I just I mentioned KSS, no KSS Node is one example. There's lots of generators. Uh, there's a whole website de dedicated to them. Uh, again, there's another uh, list apart article that goes through these and kind of goes through the pros and cons and kind of splits them out by you know whether you like to work with PHP or Ruby or Node. You know, it's got generators of every different flavor and usually forks of each one too. So you might ask, when is when do you want to use this approach? <clears throat> Uh, maybe your project doesn't afford a lot of time for upfront design. Um, maybe you want to design against a production environment, so maybe you like to just jump directly into Drupal and start kind of prototyping and designing in Drupal. Um, then you could have you know, a style guide directly from a Drupal environment. Uh, maybe you're only doing the implementation, so maybe you weren't given a style guide, but you are given some other kind of, um, or you know, maybe you weren't given a nice like interactive online style guide, maybe you were given some other kind of looser style guide. You could take that port that documentation against your you know, SAS, and then you can solve the style guide at the end. Um, and then maybe, you know, I think the most popular one is you, know, you don't want to maintain a separate custom uh, system for your other style guide. And then uh, you know, another advantage is this just keeps it in sync, and you don't ever have to worry about it because it's coming directly from the co production code. Um, lastly, uh, for lack of a better name, I'm calling this a hybrid approach. So assume you've already made it kind of to you know, development production stage. Um, you're going to take that actual CSS in JavaScript and whether you know assets that it's included in that site, create some kind of custom system, whether it's Jekyll or whatever, to um, you know list out your different you know the markup for your different components and things like that, and then that will get you a style guide. So this one is you know you're kind of taking your production code, creating another system that has those elements. Um, and then you're just applying your production code against it. So that kind of allows you to be a little bit more, more modular um, in your approach. And um, you know, ultimately, I think it's a little bit more flexible. So Happy Cog has a good uh, article they wrote about how they kind of used that approach similar to this uh, for building a style guide for the Ben & Jerry's um, style guide, which you know, was for their new site that they built. Um, some of the things that you, you know, reasons why you might take this approach, um, you might not want the documentation to live inside the SAS. You might want it kind of in a, you know, if you need more people to kind of work on the documentation, if it's all locked into SAS files, that doesn't allow, allow a lot of flexibility if, you know, you have your writing guidelines or branding guidelines and you, you know, then you're kind of maintaining two different systems, right? It works great for SAS, but it's not really great for those other examples. Uh, maybe you need some more flexibility in your environments, um, or maybe you need flexibility about how your designers and developers work together. So that Happy Cog article, they kind of talked about how um, you know, one person was able to just jump in and start designing and building the site, and then another designer was able to kind of leverage that code to then kind of, um, you know, throw it into a Jekyll site to then provide documentation and build a style guide, you know, as the site's kind of being built. So that's kind of cool. And then if you want to take your style guide to the next level, there are these people. So um, Salesforce has a really awesome UX team, and they wrote this great uh, article on Medium called how to create a living design system. They put the, you can access their style guide online. It's really great. And they bought, built this really cool tool called Theo. It's up on GitHub. And what they basically, you know, I'm not, without going into too many details, they basically, it can take JSON input and then output uh, SAS, LESS, Stylus, uh, code for Android and iOS apps. So they built, it's like one repository repository for all their design properties that they can then port out to all their different web properties and apps. So it's really advanced stuff. Uh, again, uh, also Lonely Planet is doing really cool stuff where they basically created this, this guy, Ian Feather, who's style guide genius, uh, wrote a great article called The Maintainable Style Guide. And uh, their, is, their style guide is really cool. And they built a thing called the Component API, which kind of, as it sounds, turns their style guide into an API that then their application can reference. So. Uh, check out those links. Uh, another common question I get asked is, what if I already have a site and I want a style guide for it, right? So I think there's kind of two approaches, and they kind of leverage the ones I've talked about. Um, I think using kind of a hybrid approach is easier because you've already got your production, um, you know, your production SaaS. If you just build a quick, like, Jekyll site that has, you know, maybe not all of our components, but you start with the basics, typography, um, you know, colors, you know, to get those things in there, maybe a couple of other, you know, your common components. You know, you just throw that markup in there that matches what you have on the production site as long as it's reusable, or at least, you know, at this point, you're setting up 
the markup that is going to become reusable. Um, and then, you know, you're deploying your you know, production SAS directly against the style guide. Uh, and of course, you know, as you know, you could start out very basic, just college photography, and then as you want to build out more patterns, you can do so. So this is kind of the easier approach. I say the harder approach is going is using a generator, because um, this involves you going through every piece of your SAS. If it's all broken out into components and part, you know, partial components, uh, that might be easy. But if it's not, your SAS isn't really structured already. That might be more difficult. Uh, but even if it is, you've got to go through each one, write in you know the chapter guide, you know chapter headings, uh, descriptions, putting in, you know, chapters and subchapter numbers, all that stuff. So um, it's more time consuming, but in the long run, it's more sustainable. So, you know, you've done all that legwork, then you're in a good place to, you know, assuming you want to go the generator approach, um, it's going to be more sustainable in the long run uh, with the legwork up front. <clears throat> so I'm going to transition to talking about uh, best practices here. Put it online and easy to find. So you know, make it a simple URL to go to. Um, if you're comfortable doing so, I encourage you to make it public, just because people hate having to go through users, you know, logins and um, passwords and stuff like that. Uh, again, you know, your website isn't a lot of secrets. You know, you can <laughs> just view source a lot of time. So you know, who cares if people can see you know the code they're using to build your website? A lot of times, that stuff isn't really proprietary stuff. So I would say a bigger advantage is, you know, everybody in your team, no matter who they are, having them be able to just go to a URL to find this documentation is going to be a big win for you. Uh, make it for everyone. So it doesn't just have to be for designers. It's a great tool for designers and developers to talk to, to each other. But can you imagine, like, uh, you know, account manager, a project manager talking to, uh, you know, the product owner for your website and being able to use this style, you know, you know maybe the product owner can use your style guide as actually, like, a way to talk about, like, Oh well, I like the way this page is laid out, but I want to change it, you know. Or I like this component. What if we move this component over here? It's like they have the building blocks now; they've got the language, you know, to talk about it. So you know, there's a business case for it. Um, it can make, you know, the, just the management of projects easier. And then, of course, you know, design, designers and developers, uh, it really streamlines, you know, how they collaborate to, with each other. Really important: make it part of your workflow. If you decide to dive into the creating these style guides. Um, you really have to go all in for it, you know. Um, it's not something you want to like kind of try out, build a little bit, because it's immediately you're going to find it's not getting the attention that it needs. It's going to get out of date, and then once it gets too far out of date, then it's you know you're never going to go back and update it. So, really, kind of making it part of your workflow, I think, you know, is going to lead to those advantages of you know reusing code, making you know the assets of your site you know a lot more streamlined, and you know uh, ultimately making your build times faster. Uh, when you're building your components, uh, keep them general. You're really trying to aim for reusability here. So, you know, if you're creating a, you know, a carousel, don't call it homepage carousel because that thing can be used on other pages, right? So, um, you know, keep the naming conventions kind of general, and you know, start broad and then move down to, spe uh, you know, more specific things. Uh, kind of going, <laughs> adding on to the other thing, you know, make maintenance easy. So, you really want to make keep this thing up to date. So, if it's too hard to like add a new component or add documentation or you can't quite get the generator to like throw things into the style guide like that's no good because then you know if it's hard to use no one's going to use it it's going to fall out of date um, and you know that's going to prevent it from becoming part of your workflow um, all right lastly i've got some resources here this is a website that's probably started last fall and I think it's really amazing because I had been researching kind of style guides for the past year, pouring over articles and books and tools and kind of like keeping my own running list of things. And then um, uh, Brad Frost and Anna Debahan, Debahan kind of put this uh, website together and bam, now you have all these great, great resources for this, these style guides uh, all in one place. Um, I think another thing that's really exciting about style guides right now is, you know, you know, Starbucks created theirs one in the 2012, but since then we've kind of seen a couple of ones sprinkling in, uh, and now we have all kinds of examples. So there's a page on here that's got examples that just shows you all kinds of different, like really you know big name companies that are putting their style guides out there. They're writing articles about them. They are putting the code up on GitHub so you can check it out. Um, so it's a really really amazing resource, and the best part of it is that it's open source. So um, 
I encourage you to, you know, if you are, this is something you're interested in, if you write an article about it, you're free to throw it up into um, the website. If you have an example, you know, we'd love to have it up there. Uh, I've, I've been a real big fan of this repo, and I've been trying to contribute as much as possible to it. Uh, it's just a really great resource that now all these kind of disparate th ideas are kind of now in one place. And there are a couple of usability <laughs> um, uh, improvements I think can be made. So, um, you know, if you're interested in that, if you browse a site and you see things that make it hard to use or inaccessible, like I'm personally really interested in kind of, you know, making this tool really, really great in this uh, really great place uh, for the, on the web. <clears throat> Additionally, uh, Brad Frost, uh, you've probably heard of, he created a tool called Pattern Library. Uh, he kind of coined the phrase atomic design, so this idea of like kind of component-based design, break down a site into the smallest pieces. Um, he's now writing a book, and it's in process. So he is kind of just putting it up online. It's in process. He, you know, he's just writing it kind of a chapter at a time. I think it's actually all in GitHub also, if you care about uh, seeing how you create a book in GitHub. So you can check that out. Uh, additionally, um, they've created a podcast. And so I've listened to a couple of the episodes, and they're really interesting. So uh, I listened to the first two. Um, again, it's, uh, it's Brad and Anna. Uh, they interview Gina Bolton. Uh, she worked on the Salesforce style guide. So really what this is doing is they're interviewing these people who at these like really major companies. They are talking about their process, they're talking about the pros and cons, how they got their you know, bosses to buy into this. And uh, it's really interesting to hear them think about their process, you know, how it work, specifically how it works into their workflow. Um, and uh, I listened to the second one also with Federico uh, Hogado. Uh, he is at MailChimp. So you've probably seen their uh, pattern library also. Uh, and he talks through similar things. Additionally, I, the thing I talked about, I basically have been using GitHub as my own Evernote uh, for researching a lot of these things. So um, I just have a repo called UX, and I have a markdown file called style guide. So a lot of, a lot of these links are now in styleguides.io, but um, if you want to check this out also, um, I'd be glad to see it. Uh, I think that is it. Hit a button there. Um, so yeah, check that out. And uh, thank you. So I'm sure we have some questions. So let's get started. Um, OK. Um, we got a way of organizing things. Uh, but most of the, most of the times, uh, new uh, team members are added to the team. Or sometimes designers just start building their own CSS uh, files, right? But I, I think that maybe uh, we should in, uh, include in that documentation, in that um, style guide, the folder structure and what kind of styles will should be included in each of those files. Um, I would like to get your opinion about this. Yeah, so I, I think you brought up two really good points there. Uh, one is... <clears throat> I think the main reason you're starting to see people like MailChimp and Salesforce and people like that is because they're big companies. MailChimp is like 300 people. Um, you know, they have designers leaving, they have designers coming on. What a great resource to have their style guide up there. And you know, you want to train people, of course, but if you, ha if you can point them to documentation about you know, best practices, here's how we build our application, here's uh, coding standards, here's you know, how all the designs are built, here's our style guide. You know, what a great resource for like an onboarding tool for you know new people, right? It can kind of like get them started a lot faster. And the second point, um, you know, give your guide a guide. You know, I, I think a lot of these you'll see you jump into them and then boom, it's it's immediately uh, you see patterns and you see code and they just jump into code. There's no explanation about when these things are used or why or how you got here or how to modify them. So yeah, like you were saying, you know, if you have a specific structure for your themes or you know code standards, you know. Guide people through it, you know, because, you know, if, if it's a good guide, it's going to appeal to a, a wider audience than just, you know, your developers. So, you know, you need to make it, you know, uh, a good table of contents, you know, give things descriptions. And then, yeah, I, I think to your point, kind of including some of the softer stuff where, you know, it's not a pattern, you know, here's, here's, not, here's 
you know, here's, it's, not, it's not just a pattern with code. It's like, here's kind of our approach to uh, building websites or building themes, things like that, yeah. What size t-shirt do you wear? You want a t-shirt? Anybody who asks a question can go uh, pick a t-shirt over there if it's your size. Oh, now everyone wants to ask a question. All right. I, I just want to make a little invitation. There will be a buff right now, and I kind of um, prototyped a module which implements KSS Node with Drupal. And I want to show it and get some inspiration. Great, check out that buff. Have you worked with the Drupal style guide module at all? Or, or tools like that? I know there's a couple of modules now that do essentially the same thing in terms of building style guide directly in Drupal. Do you have any experience with those or any thoughts on those? Yeah, we do have uh, experience with that. <clears throat> so I haven't used it personally in a little while. Uh, as I understand, it's a module you enable and it comes out with some default output of um, you know, kind of basic web elements, so typography, uh, images, things like that, but then also some Drupal specific stuff. So like maybe like uh, pagers or messages, things like that. Um, I think the thing we found is it's a good tool to aid developers because, but it's not something you would ever show a client. So it's a way to like kind of gut check your own work because here, you know, you're building your site, you create all your styles, and then here's a page that just spits out every kind of you know, element, web, you know, HTML element you can think of, and here's kind of how you can like, you know, QA it to see if things look okay. I think we found out it wasn't super flexible, and like, it, it allowed you to kind of add things to it, but, you know, it wasn't structured at all. I think that was our, our kind of thing we didn't like. It was just, it just kind of spit everything out on one page. So I think, but I think that is a good example of maybe the hybrid approach where you're using your production SaaS against, you know, um, against kind of, you know, um, custom HTML elements. How would I improve it? Um, I think I would look to see, you know, how some of these like Jekyll style guides are are, are structured, how they um, how they actually structure their files, because I mean it's kind of similar to um, you know SAS partials. You know, they're breaking down each component into a you know maybe not a Markdown file, but like an HTML file. Um, you know, but it's keeping everything very separated and like individualized so it's like easy to find within the code itself. Uh, additionally, that allows you to give you structure in your actual style guide yourself. So instead of just getting a page that spits out all the elements on the page, you know, you'd be able to, you know, create chapters and subchapters. Um, so I think that would go a long way uh, in kind of improving that module. I don't think I need that. Well, the recording. Oh, the recording. Okay. So what would be the one thing you would do to incorporate the style guide into the workflow? Like if you had to do one thing, what would that be? And who would you give it to? I, I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, the style guide is not like written in stone. It's not like here's the style guide, here's the thing that everyone must follow to build anything. You know, you want to build a new section on the site, you want to use new components, too bad. You have to use the existing ones. Like, that's not really what this thing is for. It's meant to be flexible. It's meant to be updated. Um, but your approach, I think, should be to, for your workflow is, you know, reference the guide first. See if you can use those default components as they are. And if you can make a, you know, if the designers can make a case that something needs to be uh, modified or, you know, you need to make, like, an alternate version of it, great. Add it to the style guide. You're building on to, you know, the base thing and you're creating, you know, uh, all, you know, modified versions. Or if you revisit that original component and you're like, ah, we really wrote that in a dumb way, you know, change it, right? So it's not supposed to be written in stone, you know. It's like, it's, it's a conversation starter. It's like, if we can reuse it, great. Then we don't have to write any more CSS. If it doesn't quite fit our needs, let's have a conversation about it and, you know, maybe modify it or, or build on it. When looking at uh, the SAS and all the commenting that goes on, and I know how people love to comment their code, how do you convince people to do that then? Or who does it? I, I would say, yeah, you know, I, I, organizations are all different. You know, a lot of designers are digging into code now, so I can imagine a world where, you know, where a lot, you know, the designers are actually doing this. You know, if they're writing the SAS, they could be writing those comments also. It's just that 
you know, if you're doing a pull request and someone's reviewing that pull request, if that code is, you know, just kind of make it part of your culture that, you know, if you're using this, if this is a, co a tool that, you know, you've all kind of bought into, then, you know, you just have to kind of uh, police yourselves into knowing that this is a, you know, a good thing to have. It's going to help, you know, onboarding. It's helping you build things faster and just make it part of your, you know, maybe your code review process that, like, okay, you wrote this new SAS. Did you, did you write documentation? Did you write in the, the right way? Did you check the style guide to see if it kind of, you know, was generated into the style guide in a, you know, readable way? Hey, um, so one of the biggest problems we've had with implementing a, a separate style guide that we import into our production site um, is keeping the markup consistent. The SAS, no problem. Um, have you figured out a good way of doing that, or do you know of any good ways of keeping the markup consistent as well as the styling? No. Um, <laughs> I think I think that's a that is a big problem. Yeah, SAS is one thing, but markup, especially you know, yeah, if you're if you're just writing a static HTML site, maybe that's easy. But you know, if you're using uh, Drupal or some other CMS, you know, how do you make sure that's going to be consistent? Um, you know, in the in KSS. One thing that's nice about that generator is that it's actually asking you, you know, I don't think you have to, but you know, if you want to get the best, the most out of it, um, you know, you want to write that markup in your SAS, you know, in that exam that button example, you know, you're writing the button out, you know, HTML uh, in the documentation itself, and that's what it's using the style against. So, um, I think KSS shows that markup at the bottom of the page. So it's like, you know, that example I showed, you know, it showed all the buttons, and at the bottom it was like. You know, button elements, class, and modifiers. Um, but you know, that's a really simple example. You know, if you've got something like uh, a view that's returning, you know, a bunch of teasers and things like that, you can ma you know, you can imagine that gets pretty complicated. So, um, yeah, just caught. <laughs> okay, he was saying, um, you know, just are you, are you saying just put write the HTML? And put it into the documentation, whether you're prototyping it or whatever. Okay. Okay. So he's saying either you know take your the, if you're happy with the output that Drupal is putting out, you know throw that into your SAS documentation for your generator. Or, you know, if you have a specific way you want the markup, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of times, you know, if you're going with one of the other methods where you're, you know, um, you know the designer is saying, okay, here's how I want a teaser to look. Um, and they're writing the markup about, you know, where they want. And, you know, maybe they know something about Drupal so they can, you know, throw in things like, you know, views and classes and things like that. Um, you know, and then they're kind of, you know, setting what the markup would like. And then uh, the designer and the developer can have a conversation about whether uh, that's possible. Any other questions in the back? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the the talk. Uh, it's been enlightening a, a little bit. Um, we have been working with style guides, but the old PSD Photoshop kind of thing, and now we're migrating to living style guides. And um, one of the I stumbled, I think, was your work well, of Four Kitchens. It was a style guide of uh, that says it's alumni or something like that, I believe. Uh, at one point, I saw like some um, like branding color typography, and like a month later, I saw a whole different thing, or two months later. Um, and I find it really fascinating that you, I think, I, I didn't really know which tool you use, but uh, it would be great if you could talk us that a little bit. Uh, I think what I saw is that you build small components, and then somehow you build the page using uh, classes from panels, I think it was, and like the layout of the page was like exactly, exactly, um, exactly how it looked at the end. Uh, if you could talk us that, about that. Okay, he was asking about a uh, style guide that we built for Texas Exes. It's an alumni organization for the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, I believe for that project we used a tool called Style Prototypes, which I mentioned earlier. So uh, previously we had been kind of using our own kind of uh, Home-built or custom-built Jekyll thing to you know output our style guide. Uh, that was our first uh, time we used style prototypes, <clears throat> and 
if you've ever looked at Pattern Lab, they're very similar. So kind of Pattern Lab and style prototypes kind of use this atomic, actually Pattern Lab, or sorry, style prototypes can optionally use atomic design. In this Texas X's example, that's what we did use. Uh, I'll make sure to like throw that example of that style. That's a good example of ours that I forgot to throw in here. Um, so it's using the atomic design kind of philosophy. So, um, you know, atoms, elements, I forget, molecules, all that, right? So um, instead of kind of breaking it down by chapters, that's how it kind of breaks it down. So it's, you're starting with the very smallest components like a header, and then you might put that into a larger component, which is like a teaser. So now you've got a header and, um, you know, uh, like an image and a teaser text. And then you could actually start to throw that into, um, you know, maybe a view where it's putting all those teasers and things. And then now you can throw those things into layouts. So it allows you to start with these atoms, throw them into larger components, and then actually throw them into page layouts without rewriting in that code because you're just throwing in, um, you know, like tokens, uh, you know, that you've already built to build out these layouts. And it's a really great prototyping tool um, because it's all responsive. It has some other things, neat things thrown into it like, you know, changing your viewports and things like that dynamically without having to like click and drag your screen. So um, I will say that style type, style, we found style prototypes a little bit challenging uh, to work with, um, but we did like that it provided a lot of structure and kind of had those prototyping and layout tools out of the box where uh, our other tool did not. All right, I think that's it. Thanks everybody.